mid-market, so much ignored. How can you change or improve those neighborhoods as district attorney? Yeah, actually, really good question. And I think for some of you that know, uh, when I first came to the city, one of the things that I made a statement that I thought the, the, what was going on in Tenderloin uh, was unacceptable. It was like a place that was sort of left uh, to the cave with very little attention. And I was not just referring to the police, by the way, because I believe that the police generally has a role, obviously, but there is a role, it's a community role that involves many other people. And, you know, how do you deal with the root causes of the problem? How do you prevent crime problems from occurring? Um, how do you deal with you know, the offenders and the victims? And, you know, what are the outcomes that you look for? And as a result of that, we, we started to analyze what was going on in the Tenderloin. And obviously, we're a long way from getting to the solution, but we realized that we had there were really multiple layers of the problem there. One was, uh, you know, mid-level and upper-level narcotics dealing that was coming from other places, uh, and it was purely for profit type of environment. And then you had, obviously, the lower-level sales that were occurring uh, by people on the street that are mostly driven by their own habits and often by a combination of mental illness and drug abuse problems. And then, obviously, some of the people that were coming, even from other communities, to buy drugs there. Okay, so what we started to do is we tried to, try to deal with the high level stuff at the same time that we were dealing with the mid level. To move it to forward, because I don't have enough time to get into all of it, let me just say that what we're trying to do with this case is we're working through our neighborhood courts. We believe, first of all, drug use is not something that should be criminalized, it's really a health, it's a public health issue. And for those that have a drug abuse problem, we need to look at it as a health issue. Okay, let's go a little bit more than a minute. Next question for Charmaine. Tell us about the relationships you have in place in the SFDA's office, SFPD, Board of Supervisors, and Mayor's office that would facilitate the spirit of collaboration between these agencies when you take office. I uh, wrote a federal grant. Speak into the microphone. Thanks, I'll definitely be listening to you. <laughs> I uh, wrote a federal grant and uh, was one of only four agencies to get the grant, the only one actually west of the Mississippi. And that grant brought $300,000 to the Bay Area to uh, create a response to child sex trafficking, which is unfortunately the largest uh, unrecognized form of child abuse in our country and a growing epidemic in the Bay Area. As a result of that $300,000 grant, I formed a partnership with nine Bay Area counties, including San Francisco. Actually, then Police Chief George Gascon signed my MOU uh, in terms of bringing together all the partners at the table to solve that on a multidisciplinary collaborative approach because it really does take a village. And given especially the fact that the internet has blurred jurisdictional borders, we have to reach outside of ourselves. Law enforcement is sadly siloed. So first and foremost, I have been committed and continue to be committed to forming very close relationships with those partners. I've worked closely with service providers here, with people within the district attorney's office. I've done an outreach program to the mayor's department, and as well as other organizations in the city and all other nine Bay Area counties as well. Regionalization is the future for crime solving. Uh, what are your plans for reforming the juvenile justice system in San Francisco, in particular, how to effectively combat gang violence and address disproportionate minority confinement rates? Thank you for that question. That's actually something that I focus much, on my, much of my career on, as I talked about earlier, uh, working directly with kids in the system when I was at Walden House and Legal Services for Children, setting policies for kids in the system when I was at the National Council on Crime and Delinquency, and specifically focusing on the overrepresentation of youth and color when I was at the Burns Institute. I really look forward to juvenile justice reform in San Francisco, and I think that's why so many juvenile justice reform advocates are supporting me. We need to look at our policies and practices very, very closely to see if there are policies and practices that have an unintentional effect of 
having a disparate impact on kids of color in the system. And I have tremendous experience of doing that, not only in San Francisco, but in cities around the country, and places like Santa Cruz, which has the best juvenile justice system in the country and is a model. I work very hard to help reform that system and endorsed by most of the leaders in Santa Cruz who have what everyone say is the model criminal justice system in the state and really in the country. I also look to bring a restorative justice program to the juvenile justice system here in California, that in, in San Francisco, that brings victims and juvenile offenders together. Uh, I have done a lot of work around restorative justice issues in the past and uh, look forward to implementing a very uh, progressive and very fair and thoughtful restorative justice pilot in the juvenile justice system in San Francisco. you support making drug possession a misdemeanor in California? Drug possession? Well, I think that a very big question with regard to drug possession is take that one step further. Do we even need to be criminalizing drug possession in California? Yeah. And I gotta tell you, when we don't have any jail space, when we don't have enough lawyers and services directed at those um, that are within the criminal justice system, I think we need to do everything we can to get people out of the criminal justice system. Uh, I would support, actually, a diversion program where we don't even file, where we divert people away from criminalization before they are charged and give them every opportunity to deal with their addiction issues outside of the criminal justice system. It's a real thing, folks. We've got a lot of people coming back from Sacramento, from prisons that are going to be in our community. We have got to open our eyes and get hardcore about how we're going to deal with this. So we are going to need a varsity response that's totally outside of the box. And let me just say this, I'm the only candidate running for district attorney that has a track record of implementing innovation within a district attorney's office. That's how I met Jackie Spear, who is one of my strong endorsers. I was testifying in the Senate in Washington, D.C. about human trafficking, about the program that I came up with called Heat Watch based on Neighborhood Watch. And uh, those are the kinds of innovative programs we need to expand to areas including drugs. George, an audience member writes, how do you feel about marijuana, both medical and recreational? <laughs> there are people incarcerated for longer than Alana Semester really was. Uh. Well, actually, uh, you know, I, I don't believe that marijuana should be an area where we incarcerate people, certainly not for use of it. Um, I believe that um, the use of marijuana is something that should be, by and large, decriminalized, and it has been, by the way. I think that when there's discussions about people being in prison because of the use of marijuana, generally it's a much more nuanced uh, issue, but nevertheless, the reality is that, that here in San Francisco, and let's deal with it here, is that people are not being incarcerated, in fact, people are not being tried for the use of drugs. Uh, diversion is what we use, uh, by and large, and we're actually taking it one step further, uh, we're moving more and more cases into the area of neighborhood courts, which is even one step below diversion because of the complete decriminalization of low-level offenses. When we take people into neighborhood courts, it's a complete restorative justice model. And, and by the way, you know, you have someone that actually is implementing major reforms within the DA's office, and that's me. Uh, starting with neighborhood courts system, uh, we're also looking at preparing for realignment way before anybody else. We're taking big picture approach to policies in the criminal justice system and how do we get better outcomes? How do we move away from incarcerating people at the rates that we have for drug use and for low level offenses? And how do we reduce recidivism? We cannot continue to have a 70% recidivism rate and we're already showing results in our diversion courts getting down into the 20, 22%. David, an audience member, writes, you have said that no one who has worked in, justice, in the justice system is qualified to reform it. What about Kamala Harris? Sure, I appreciate that question. Here's what I'm saying. We are at a point right now where the best person to reform the system is somebody from outside the system. 
Kamala Harris made a good start in this town, and I think we'd all agree on that. But even Kamala Harris did not go far enough, and I think part of it is a law enforcement approach. Let me take the issue of truancy. Now, I'm a strong supporter of doing everything we can to keep kids in schools. That's why six of the seven school bar members have endorsed me, and that's why the Teachers Union, United Educators of San Francisco, have endorsed me. I applaud Kamala for taking a leadership uh, on reducing truancy in San Francisco. But I think her approach was too law enforcement based because ultimately she was willing to incarcerate parents if their kids did not go to school. Now again, I applaud the thought behind that in doing everything the DA's office can to reduce truancy, but that is a law enforcement approach that is not going to solve any problems. How is it going to help a kid get to school if their parent is locked up? I've never understood that. And to me, it's just like, if, if a kid doesn't go to school, you suspend the kid and say, you can't go to school for three days? That just doesn't make any sense either. And so, um, I think that, uh, again, uh, if you've come from a law enforcement background your whole career, even some of the most progressive law enforcement leaders that I respect the most, do not go back, go far enough. They are stuck in this law enforcement perspective. That's why we need an outsider and a reformer right now in San Francisco. I'm going to do three more questions, and then we'll go to closing argument. Um, Charmaine, this is a long question, but a good one. Uh, concerning homeless, the homeless shelter system, how do you feel about the rule of confidentiality that prevents law enforcement officers from entering a shelter's inner court, especially in situations where someone has been at least verbally threatened, does not feel safe, and has spoken with staff, and finally has to call the police to intervene. I think that... Sorry. I got it. I was waiting for that. You scared me. Confidentiality has been a challenge to many collaborative efforts, uh, and one of the ways in which you circumvent confidentiality and still honor the integrity of the process and the mission of each of the partners at the table is through the multidisciplinary collaborative approach. It is an approach that we have utilized uh, in our human trafficking program where we have partners with very strict confidentiality restrictions at the same table. So I think one way to look at that is to bring people to the table to discuss in a multidisciplinary approach where the confidentiality of the clients, where the confidentiality of the victims and the defendants are all respected in order to meet their needs. We have many people falling through the cracks of our system, and let me just say this, confidentiality doesn't serve the purpose for which it was intended if in fact it results in the further uh, minimalization and marginalization of the people that it was there to support in the first place. I think we've all come up against bureaucracy. You don't need me to sit, here, I sit up here and tell you about uh, bureaucracy and how it doesn't serve us. So we really need to think outside the box and get results. I'm all about delivering results. George, uh, could you explain in concrete terms how you could reduce the crushing caseload of misdemeanor on misdemeanor ADAs in San Francisco, assist, on the assist, assistant district attorney? That's uh, really a really great question because it is crushing. And what we have done is actually we, through the reorganization of the office, which was a product of uh, a lot of work with people within the office as well as the bench and other partners, and we started to identify cases that we can take out of our regular criminal justice system, decriminalize them, and bring them into our neighborhood court. So that was the first step. We were taking a lot of low level offenses, using a 100% restorative justice process, taking those cases out of our criminal justice system, put them into neighborhood courts. Then the second step that we have done is that we've taken and continually take more of a very aggressive look at low-level misdemeanors that do not qualify for neighborhood courts and we're moving them into diversion court, whether it's behavioral court, whether it's drug court, or some of the other alternative court models that we have. And finally, the other piece that we're doing in this process that is ongoing and we're developing uh, with the assistance of the probation department, we're developing evaluation tools that we look at a case when it comes into our hands 
And rather than think as a prosecutor, we're trying to think as a policymaker in a much broader sense. And how do we get good outcomes? How do we reduce recidivism? What are the areas that we can go? And in doing this, what we're creating is a model where we can look at the offender, we look at the victim, we look at the impact in the community, and take an approach that will develop programs, wraparound programs for the individual offender and ensure that we take care of the victim and not necessarily prosecute the case in the traditional sense. Jailing people for low level offenses is not working and we know that and yet we continue to do it and that is something that we're already moving away from in the San Francisco District Attorney's Office. Thank you. Last audience question, this is actually two that I'm going to put, but they're related. Uh, one is a significant number of parolees, or this is for David, sorry. A significant number of parolees are returned to prison for minor parole infractions, adding prison overcrowding and cost. If elected DA, how would you specifically address this issue? And the other question is, in light of the Supreme Court's decision concerning the release of inmates to address prison overcrowding, if elected DA, how would you respond to these releases? Sure, thanks for the question, and they are related. So we need to prepare now for realignment and for all these prisoners who are gonna be coming back to our city and county. And by we, I don't just mean the district attorney's office, I mean all the law enforcement agencies and our community partners. We need right now to be getting together and talking about how we're gonna handle this. And I'm very, very proud that so many leaders in the community on reentry issues have endorsed my candidacy and will work collaboratively with me on this. Specifically on parolees, you're absolutely right that we in, in California are totally dysfunctional where we send people back to prison for 30, 60, 90 days for minor things like failing a drug test or being late to an appointment with a parole officer. That is a complete waste of resources that needs to be changed. What we need to do is develop alternatives at the local level. People do need to be held accountable. There need to be sanctions and there need to be consequences. But let's not waste our precious prison beds that need to be reserved for serious and violent offenders for people who are drug offenders who failed a drug test. That makes absolutely no sense. So we need to provide those alternatives. It gets back to my earlier point, though, too. We need to advocate effectively on the state level to make sure that the resources follow these prisoners from the state so that law enforcement and community-based organizations have the resources we need to effectively handle these folks locally. It is much better to put people in the most least restrictive setting closest to home. That's what realignment does. But I'll tell you right now, if we don't plan effectively and collaborate with all the partners that I've worked so closely with in the last 20 years, realignment will be a step in the wrong direction. However, it's an incredible opportunity if we do it right. Many thanks to the audience members for really good questions, and I apologize for the folks that I didn't get to their questions. There are many, many good ones. Um, we're going to save these last few minutes for a closing argument, and we're going to go.